Mayfield will be there. He doesn't know it, but I just I just made him work on Saturday. Bill, we'll see you there about 8 a.m. Don't oh, be looking, late. Looking forward to I'm it, I'm not Rob. getting there until 10 myself, but I need you there at 8 o'clock. Let's uh, welcome in the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Billy. Can I bend my, my pajamas? Or do I have to? Bill, the fact that you're there is good enough for me. I don't care what you're wearing. It'll be just like Walmart. Nobody will notice the difference. <laughs> <laughs> you know, send, send Mike today. And uh, we think of the 49ers, uh, the 1849ers, going, going across country and all the rough treatment they had and how they were uh, sleeping under the, with the sand and the mosquitoes and all that. That does not compare to Mike Height's story about the going across country on Amtrak. Mike, good morning. <laughs> good morning. How are you, Robert? It's good to be here. Uh, so the only question I have for you now that you're back from riding the rails is, would you do it again? Not a chance <laughs> in H-E double hockey sticks. <laughs> no. Height for the 20 minutes after yeah. he got here just destroyed Amtrak and for and, 20 straight minutes. And, and it's so bad. I started feeling sorry for him, Rob. <laughs> for and just I'm, a second. I'm, I'm, not, I, it didn't yeah, last long. I've never felt sorry for Mike Height in the past, but I did today. <laughs> did not enjoy the, the train part. Now, you like the Grand Canyon. Oh, the Grand Canyon was spectacular. I mean, if you've never been to the Grand Canyon, I would recommend that to anybody. Um, spend three or four days to a week down there go down the go down the river on a raft um take a, a horse or mule or whatever <clears throat> down into the canyon do all that kind of stuff because that place is just uh amazing yeah i may have mentioned to you bonnie and i spent 21 days going through the canyon sir a few years ago they, they got lost a couple times <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bill, i did. told you we've been this three times i've seen that rock three <laughs> times <laughs> no bonnie how much you know just that's not the same rock <laughs> bill i don't care what your degree is that's the same damn rock <laughs> there goes my story mike <laughs> <laughs> hey, let's welcome in our uh, first guest of the uh, the day here, the House Majority Leader, Eric Halsoder. E, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing really well. And, man, it's great to be around some stellar co-hosts today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank hey, you, Mr. Majority yeah, Leader. You're uh, welcome. Don't, don't take a break in your discussion this morning, Eric, because Mike will start telling us about Amtrak, and I don't think we're going to handle it again. <laughs> hey, look, I had a bad experience one time. We were in Boston, and our flight was canceled or so we decided to take the train from Boston to Baltimore and creeping along at about 35, 40 miles per hour and stopping 200 times. I think we finally made it to Baltimore, but what an adventure. So. <laughs> Yikes. This is not a ringing endorsement for travel by train. Yeah. <laughs> by train, jeez. Uh, uh, Eric, you, if you heard the opening uh, with the other Eric, Finance Chairman Eric Tarr out of the Senate, we uh, saw some of the numbers from March. Had a chance to digest those, but he mentioned a couple of concerns out there, including unemployment insurance, as uh, as one of those. Let's uh, hit those numbers again. Colin's going to right now slide across the chart. Uh, go ahead and bring that up on the TV screen so everybody at home uh, can see it, watching it on TV10 and also on our uh, TV10 Facebook page. This is a look at the uh, the revenues and uh, year to date as well. So Eric, uh, we look pretty good uh, we considering did. we had an income tax cut. We do, and we continue to look good. And as I mentioned several months ago, if we continue on the path of seeing at least a $60 million surplus per month, you could see around a 700 to $800 million surplus again. So personal income tax for the month ending uh, March, we exceeded our estimates by $48 million. A Consumer sales tax, we exceeded our estimates by $5.5 million. And severance tax, we uh, exceeded our estimates by 26 million. So all told, we brought in an extra 94 million, almost 95 million dollars for the month of March. And uh, we're on target right now. Well, as of at the end of March, we're at a 522 million, 915,415 dollars surplus. So all indications, things are moving along very well, even with the personal income tax cut. Now, speaking of that personal income tax cut, if you remember back, uh, oh, it was back in, I believe it was, uh, September, or back in 23, we socked away an extra $400 million into a personal income tax relief fund in case anything would go awry. Well, today, as of March 31st, that, that, that fund has grown to $460 million. So at the end of March, we're at $460 million in that fund. So 
you know, we're doing very well. Explain how that fund will work, Eric, when it comes to an income tax trigger. How does that fund come into play versus the general revenue surpluses? Okay, it's real easy. And, and the whole idea, the whole concept behind the triggers were not only to tie it to inflation, but to limit the amount of spending that the legislature could do to about no more than 5% per year. So this past session, we passed a uh, pay raise bill. That's about 5%. You're seeing inflation right around 4%. So 5 and 4 is 9%. We can cut up to 10%, but if you take into account the triggers, you're only going to see about a 1% income tax cut, and that's all it is. So we're trying to tie it to the inflation rate and limit spending, and that's what's left over. Uh, I wanted to make sure that we weren't going to go down the same path that uh, Kansas went went down. And uh, so I'm trying to be prudent, and I think it's a prudent way to cut the income tax cuts um, even the, 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 the biggest liberal group out there, the Center for Budget and Policy, had a working paper that came out the other day, and they suggested from 2019 to the current budget year 2025, if you adjust it for inflation, you have seen reductions in the budget of about $760 million. So I can tell you the flatline budget is working if you're a strong believer in limited, smaller government. We're, we're seeing that happen. Bill? Yeah, uh, good morning, Eric. Good morning, uh, Bill. The, uh, there is absolutely no question the flatline budget ha- has worked and has served West Virginia well. And I want, wish to applaud you and Craig and all the others that made it happen. That's, uh, it's, it's served us well. But are we getting to the point that some of our infrastructure needs, our, imp- our uh, agency needs, are... Uh, need some need a shot in the arm need another financial boost are we getting to that point and that's why we're doing what you see in the back of the budget we're doing those one-time spends we're not doing base building i know a lot of people will that i and i listen to your show most mornings but you hear a lot of people advocate hey instead of using the back of the budget let's put it all in the front and let's just have a, a frank conversation about budgeting okay Let's, uh, let's have a discussion here. We'll, we'll say Bill Stubblefield, and we'll use Mike Height. You two are the taxpayers, okay? Rob, you're going to be the legislature. So let's say that Mike Height and Bill Stubblefield each give me $2, and I'll, and this role, in this little role playing that we're going to do, I'm going to be the governor. Can we get so more I'm, from Bill, though? Because I think he's got, a, he's got more to give than Mike does. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> Gil, Gil Scrap needs me in this conversation. <laughs> well, we're trying to make it simple, so we're just going to say $4, and then we're going to bring in the mogul. Let's use Mike Hornby. Mike Hornby will be the federal government. He's going to give me $10. So I'm going to give you a budget, uh, Rob, and you're the legislature. I'm going to give you an overall budget of $14, okay? But of that $14, $4 of it is general revenue. Uh, but that's your general revenue budget. Now, you look at that budget. I, I come, I give the state of the state, I, I say peace, love, and happiness, and I give you this budget of $14. When you look at it, you decide that you want to cut $0.50 cents out of the general revenue. Okay? So now you went from $4 to $3.50. And you say, I want to cut $0.50. Cents. So you only appropriate... Three dollars and fifty cents in this budget. So throughout the entire budget year, we are spending no more than three dollars and fifty cents. Now the problem is the fifty cents you you refuse to do something with it now becomes general revenue unappropriated money. All right, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. You said you wanted to cut, but you didn't. The, the legislature was given the authority to spend four million, or excuse me, four dollars. I gave you the authority to spend four dollars, but you only spent three dollars and fifty cents. You failed to do something else with the fifty cents, so it becomes general revenue unappropriated. So the next next following year, I come out, I give you another state of the state, peace, love, and happiness. But this time, I give you a budget of fourteen dollars and fifty cents. Because the the mogul gave me ten dollars, he's the federal government. Mike Height still gave me two dollars as a taxpayer, so did Bill Stubblefield. But I'm also picking up that fifty cents that you failed to to spend or do anything with. So this time you've got a general revenue budget of four dollars and fifty cents. Okay, 
and you look at it and you say, I'm going to cut it to $3.50. So now you've cut a dollar out of this little simplistic budget. But this time you decide that you're going to be smarter about it. You're going to take 50 cents of that dollar and you're going to plug it away into the rainy day fund. And then you're going to take the other 50% and you're going to put it in, we'll call it a personal income tax relief fund. And then you say, I'm going to also put 10 cents in the back of the budget. And then you give this budget back to me now, it's $3.40. So you've limited spending to $3.40 throughout the year. But effectively, you put 50 cents in the rainy day, you put 50 uh, cents into a personal income tax, and you put 10 cents in the back of the budget. Does all that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I'm waiting for you to introduce fractions, and that's why yeah. I get confused. Well, I'm trying to make it simple, just simple numbers. So. Oh, second. Eric, because making it simple for me or for my kite? No, just for your listeners in general, you know what I mean? <laughs> but uh, that's with the whole so budget process. That's how it works. And, uh, you know, we're still funding the necessary requirements of government. We, I mean, in the last five years, we've given pay raises. We're doing uh, more money into road maintenance. I mean, it was a long-out diatribe there of how the whole budget process works. But, uh, yeah, we're still funding all the necessary resources that the government needs, Bill. But if you're a strong believer in limited, smaller government, you're going to try to keep to a flat budget as much as possible. Now, it hasn't remained completely flat because the last five years we've we did pay raises, so there's a two hundred million dollar increase almost every time that we do a pay raise. So, but generally, it's remained flat. Yeah. So, uh, I'm yeah. sorry. Go ahead, Eric. I... Well, some people will say, okay, now that so at the end of this budget session, uh, or at the end of this fiscal year, you're going to see a seven hundred million. Let's just assume that we're going to see a seven hundred million dollar surplus. So the legislature has three options: we can a decide to spend it. B, we could do something with it, like redirect it into a personal income tax fund. Or if we don't do anything, it all becomes general revenue unappropriated. So next year when the governor presents his budget to us, the governor's going to take advantage of that $700 million. I argue all the time it's best that the legislature makes the decision instead of allowing the governor to make the decision. Yeah. Yeah, and I agree. Uh, Eric, I think your simplistic uh, example was quite effective, I, I, and, I, and I'm serious. I think it was uh, good. But uh, let me. Uh, but a question it raised, and I don't know if you did it intentionally or just kind of a uh, just a con- order of convenience. Uh, you mentioned that four dollars came out of taxation. Yes. Uh, then a ten dollars came from the federal government. Yes. Is that approximately the, uh, the correct ratio? No, I'm just using it yeah. as an example because our overall budget is about 19 to 20 billion dollars. So our general revenue uh, budget is about 4.2 to 4.3 of all the taxes that we collect from uh, the citizens of West Virginia. It's about 4.3 billion dollars. The other 15 billion is coming in from taxpayers all across the United okay, States. Yeah, and and I I. I've heard in the past that uh, that West Virginia is on the receiving end uh, that we receive back from the federal government much more than we pay into the federal government. Correct? That is correct. Yeah. And every year that we get federal dollars, once again, the legislature has a dis- uh, decision to make. They can elect to spend the money if they so desire, or they could say no, and they could send it back. If they choose to send it back, obviously it would go to some other state. Yeah. Uh, Let's go back a couple minutes to the back end of the budget. We've heard a lot about that the last yes. couple of so years, uh, and it does. It, it serves a great purpose of uh, doing infrastructure needs, such as uh, uh, deferred maintenance in s- yes. some of our buildings. It does less of a good purpose of keeping up with inflation for some of our uh, state employees. How do you address that? That has to be a front end of the budget, does it not? Uh, yeah, any time that you do a pay raise, it becomes the front of the budget. It is base building. So I think we've taken a very proactive, my last uh, six years in the legislature, we've done five pay raises. So, I mean, unheard of. We're trying to, you know, to fix these problems as quickly as we can. We've addressed PEIA concerns. We've been trying to address 
secondary road maintenance. I mean, since the Republicans took over in 2015 with our first session, I mean, we've been bombarded with one problem after another, and we're trying to fix it as fast as we can. Can can our our salary needs be fixed with uh, with the pay raises that we've given them out? I I hear a lot of uh, on several different fronts, not only the educators, uh, but DHHR and others that we do not pay our staff enough to be truly competitive in the job market. Well, we see that problem obviously in the Eastern Panhandle. We and I've heard. We've all talked about it for years. We've talked about locality pay, and uh, it's, it's been an issue for us in the eastern Panhandle and other parts of the state's, state as well. But, uh, I mean, there's a decision that has to be made is do the citizens want to see a tax increase? Okay, it goes back to that local control uh, argument that, that you and others have made for home rule. Uh, do the citizens of Berkeley County want to pass home rule or have a tax increase to pay for higher services you know pay, or higher salaries salaries for EMS uh, fire department teachers i mean that's a discussion that we've been having for years and our citizens clearly say time and time again no they're not willing to pay more in taxes so i i don't know that i agree with that eric i know that's your assessment <laughs> but but our our uh our citizens have never been given that. That would be, you know, if we were to pass the home rule uh, for counties, that would be a referendum issue, and it would have to go to each county at a referendum level. That's how the original bills were written. So the people would have the opportunity at that point to decide whether or not uh, individual counties wanted that home rule or not. Um, But that's never been the case. The, The legislature hasn't allowed that yet. But I want to go back to some other points. I think, uh, you know, one of the other things that we've done with the flatline budget is it has helped us identify where money is truly needed. Um, And in so doing, it has caused crisis in certain areas, um, which some could recognize as as good or bad. But it has helped the legislature determine where the the greatest need is. And, And obviously that was need in corrections for a while that was needed in, in CPS. Um, obviously, we had teachers issues. And I think the legislature over the past uh, you know, five or six years has addressed a lot of those key needs um, with base building. Now, w- when you say a flatline budget, we also have natural growth um, as well, which is, um, I, I don't know, Eric, $100 million or, or so? Roughly $100 okay. million. So, so in, in that that allows us to do some base building um, as we go on and continue with what we classify as a flatline budget. But I think there's also, and Bill brought up a, a good point, is um, in the Medicaid area. I think there there are areas that are in crisis right now in Medicaid. Medicaid is is five billion dollars is is what their um, their total nut is and. Of that, I think the federal government chips in like 75, 80 percent. Is that correct, Derek? They do, um, but I want to start here. The, the paradigm that we're in, do we want to continue to become a welfare state in West Virginia, or do we want to shift that narrative and say, okay, enough is enough. I want to give more money back to the taxpayers because, once again, you hear me and others and, and yourself talk about a $700 million surplus. That's basically an overtaxation of our citizens. So I've been advocating. The whole reason of this flatline budget was to use this money predominantly for tax relief to our citizens. I've said it time and time again. Economic theory suggests if you want more of something, you're supposed to tax less of it. So I said, let's put economic theory to the test. Now, Granted, we have used this money for one-time necessary things like deferred maintenance that Bill just mentioned, or secondary road maintenance, and, and, and other things. But I think the whole if, – if we were to survey people in Berkeley County and say, would you want more money in your wallet, or would you rather pay higher taxes to fund other services, I think the people would say they want more money in their wallet. Yeah. Uh- 
Eric, let me, uh, uh, I want to go back to a point that Mike said, and yeah. I, it was very enlightening to me. I never really thought about it. He said that, <laughs> which is unusual, Mike. Well, great job, though. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. he, he mentioned that one of the evangelists' uh, flatline budget was, uh, through time, finding out where the needs really exist. And, and I never thought about that, but I think you're exactly right, Mike. It, what it does do is to show where there's extra money available and where the needs are there. Hey, well, and, and where the crisis is yeah. as well. And we talked about a Medicaid a, little, a few minutes ago. And, and I don't know that we need to uh, necessarily base build in the Medicaid area. And Eric's right. I mean, we don't want to be a welfare state. But I think by the way that uh, we've started to break apart DHHR and, and dig down deep into their budget and sort of bring things out in line items and stuff, it, I think that's in an effort to say, all right, you, you have enough money, we just don't like the way you're spending it. And it gives the legislature the opportunity to say, you're, we're overfunding on this line item and we're underfunding on this line item and we need to move some stuff around because we don't agree with the the how the bureaucracy of dhhr is spending their money um so i think we've done a good job with that and i'll give kudos to to senator tar for breaking that down and 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 trying to dig deeper into that so i think that's what's going on right there and something else i want to bring up you know we hear negativity with people saying hey you're putting stuff in the back of the budget let's just say that our budget that the governor gives to us is four billion dollars there is nothing preventing the legislature from doing or saying all right of that four billion we're going to put two billion in the back of the budget which is called section nine general revenue surplus section and of that two billion we're going to prioritize it and the order that we want to pay out if we have a surplus okay it's done all the time i mean it's a it's a way to manage your money effectively it's a way for the legislature to have more control over the appropriation process because that is the number one job of the legislature is to appropriate the money and uh, it just allows us to make quicker and better decisions eric april may and june remain and we we are a few days into april obviously april i assume historically takes a bit of a uh, of uh, a hit with tax refunds, although on the flip side, it might also be getting a lot of tax payments in. How is April historically revenue-wise? I don't recall off the top of my head, but we'll look, if if we bring in the $60 million for the next three months, that's $180 million. We're going to be meeting that target of $700 million. Now, when we go back in May, you're going to see several ideas emerge. Hey, we need to do this, or we need to do that. If, if, we are only going to see a 1% personal income tax cut because the legislature spent 5% and there's 4% inflation. I suggest of that $700 million that we take three to $400 million of it and use it to, you know, give another 10% in personal income tax cuts, okay? That's one way to hedge against the triggers. If you're going to have a surplus, Use that money effectively to give tax relief to our citizens. We don't have to spend all $700 million on deferred maintenance or secondary road maintenance. We can elect to give it back to our citizens who are hurting because of high inflationary prices. And, Eric, when you say 1%, I want to make sure this math is, is completely yeah. clear. So yes. if, if the personal income tax rate is 4%, a 1% reduction doesn't take it to 3%. That's correct. That's it, correct. It takes it to like 3.96%. Yeah, and it's an across that 1% would be across the board, you know, so it'd be very negligible of, uh, you know, what those brackets would actually see. So I'm just, just for simple math here, like I mentioned, if we're only going to see about a 1% personal income tax cut, which is only equatable to about a $30 million tax cut, I suggest with this surplus, that we park 400 to 500 million and use that for tax relief because we already have i just mentioned earlier in your program that we socked away 400 million in a personal income tax relief fund and it's grown to 460 so we have a hedge bet there if things were to go wrong we have an extra 460 million sitting on the sidelines eric let's talk about that real quick again yeah. um that 400 460 million what yes. what is the status of that once we get down to let's say zero personal income tax um 
when would that that fund be available to either give back to the people or spend or, or whatever? When is that? a new Marshall Baseball Stadium, for instance. Let's not go that there. That fund <laughs> is subject to appropriations at any time. So okay. when I leave this, this, legis- this next year legislative session, there's going to be people that say, hey, well, I believe we should spend this $460 million. I'm not going to be there, be there to stop it, but I'm counting on you, Mike Height, to stop it and say, <laughs> no, we're going to give tax relief to our citizens. Yeah. Eric, uh, Eric lot- do you need to go, by the way? No, I'm fine. I've got a couple okay. more minutes. Fine. Yeah. Uh, a lot of folks would applaud what you just said, uh, but... A, the counter argument would be that you have a roadmap, you have a structure yeah. in place. As you methodically go through every year, you'd start working toward these triggers. Yeah. Uh, but what you're saying is that you're going. In, uh, if we have the opportunity, you'd accelerate some yeah. of the that. But yet, a lot of folks say that we still have a. Uh, numerous needs in front of us uh and uh and deferred maintenance is one on highways uh and i'll come back to the uh, to the salaries uh the teachers tell me they are still being underpaid the hhr folks we hear are still being underpaid uh in st- and this is a counter argument to your suggestion. Uh, the argument would be if there is a surplus, uh, use that to try to cut in on some of the needs that we have and then stick with your schedule as you have laid out. And I don't disagree. Obviously, that's a decision that the legislature, you know, in a whole would have to make. I mean, that was the biggest learning challenge that I had when I first got there. I thought I was going to change the world, but remember, I'm one out of there's 99 other people yeah. down there with different opinions than mine. Uh, I'm always going to advocate as much as possible to try to give it back to the citizens who gave it to us to begin with. And uh, yes, you're always going to have these needs, but remember, if we if we continue to tax our citizens, they're going to continue to leave. And we're going to stay, stay in this stagnant growth. I mean, we're trying to bring people back into West Virginia. We're trying to create that economic growth and that prosperity. Uh, so we're not just a welfare state. So we don't have this huge brain drain of people leaving the state in search of prosperity. But uh, we've got to reverse it. It's, it's going to be a conversation that we're going to have for the next couple of years. I'm just glad if we finally got something on the table. But, no, you're always going to have this debate between spending versus giving the money back, and it's going to continue. Eric, thanks so much for your time this morning. I appreciate it as always. See you guys. Thanks, Eric. Thank you very much. All right, bye. Have a great day, 35. That will be House Majority Leader Eric Householder at uh, this time. We take our break and make room for the Friday crew and this segment.